go ahead and start. Um, one quick announcement is uh, have one last book for sale. And I see uh, there's two people uh, wanted a, a books to be sent, potentially. But it's much cheaper if you get it now, because there's no shipping. <laughs> um, OK. Hmm? Uh, it is available on Amazon, yeah. yeah. All right, but uh, yeah. But every time Amazon sells a book, they kill five trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So uh, today, um, this morning, at least, we are going to focus on harvesting rainwater in tanks. Okay. Um, so to begin that talk. Uh, I want to start by uh, discussing different ways uh, we can use that rainwater that we collect in a tank. So this is a photograph taken at a plant nursery in Austin, Texas. And at this particular nursery, they don't grow any plants. Okay. They, they sell a lot of plants, but they don't grow their own. They, they buy their plants from other nurseries and then sell them. This nursery's main product that they produce is compost and compost tea. Okay. And in Austin, Texas, very much like here, they have limestone subsoil, and thus their water is very hard. Um, there's a lot of minerals in the water. So when you cook with their water, or boil water, you get white uh, stuff all over your pots. Same thing here. And uh, that hardness is not good for compost tea. Um, so, well, I, I'm sorry. It's not, the hardness is not the problem there. It's the chlorine in the water that's a problem for the, uh, the compost tea. So uh, they collect their rainwater, which has no chlorine, and they find they get dramatically better uh, compost teas when they brew with rainwater as opposed to municipal water. Uh, um, this is uh, an operation of a friend in New Mexico that uh, is growing um, his crops in a greenhouse. He has now built a second greenhouse. Uh, in his area, he gets just under 400 millimeters of rain a year. And his soil is only uh, actually about this deep, 10 centimeters. Um, and so he, uh, um, but yet he is making over uh, 600,000 US dollars a year. Um, producing organic heirloom tomatoes, microgreens, and cut flowers in this one greenhouse, irrigated only with uh, rainwater from the roof of the greenhouse and the roof of his home. Um, so he has set up gutters on the side of his greenhouse to capture that water. Now, why, first, why does he do this? Uh, he, he does it because he wanted to be a farmer, but he had no soil. <laughs> okay, 
and he also wanted to be a farmer, but his neighbors would not let him use the water from the well that they share. Okay. So he said, okay, I will grow in a greenhouse, I can make my own soil, and I will use the rain so I don't need the well. Uh, inside his greenhouse, he has tanks uh, that are half buried, half above the ground. On top of these tanks, he grows his smaller plants. He also has additional tanks down slope of his greenhouse where he can direct overflow water and then pump back up if he needs to. And he collects water off the roof of his house in tanks. That's his house that he can send to the greenhouse. Uh, he, uh, in this area, the groundwater is very high in salt. But when he tests his rainwater, there's almost zero salt. Okay. In, in fact, there's so little salt that he has to import salt. Um, but he could, he would not need to import any salt if his neighbors would just let him use a little bit of well water. They don't. They don't, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So he has a catchment area of 550 square meters. He uh, uses about um, uh, 170,000 liters of water each year, um, and uh, you basically, he has one, two, three, he has uh, five of these tanks and four of those. Okay. All right. Um, he increases his available water by taking the plastic off the greenhouse roof when it gets too old. And he lays it out on the ground on each side of the greenhouse. And he purposely put his greenhouse on land that has a 2% slope. So when it rains, he collects the water that falls on the ground here, and it moves downhill to a little pit he dug, where he has a little sump pump underneath some shelving he found from a thrown away freezer. Okay. So what I love about Paul is he is very smart and very resourceful. He's a typical farmer. Okay? Almost nothing he has is new. Okay. Um, and all his tanks he got used or he found. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, this plastic also reduces the growth of weeds on the outside of his greenhouse. So that reduces the pest problems inside the greenhouse. Um, and uh, when I visited Paul, I thought he was the only one doing this. But it turns out there are a lot of greenhouses in Egypt that are doing this as well. Uh, informed by research, Syrian research at uh, 
Okay. At an institute called ICARDA, and you can web search this. They have uh, a lot of information on uh, water harvesting. I, uh, the website is still functioning. I don't know if the research institute is still functioning at the moment. Um, is the one in Aleppo? This is outside Aleppo. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is uh, photographs from a f another farm in New Mexico. Uh, a Seeds of Change farm. It's a company that uh, grows out seed to sell. And uh, this uh, photograph, well, wait. Uh, at this farm, uh, they would grow out their seed in their greenhouse and then plant the seedlings in the fields. But because the irrigation water was so salty, they sometimes lost up to 80% of their seedlings before they got them into the field. Okay. So they would use well water and uh, ditch water, irrigation ditch water, or acequia water in Spanish, which is an uh, uh, irrigation ditch from the river. Okay. But both were so salty they were killing many of their plants. So they uh, guttered the roof of the very big barn above the greenhouse, which is down below. They used uh, ir um, irrigation piping for their downspout that they ran along the fence to a series of um, large uh, tanks, uh, which are over, they're over here. And with gravity, they move the water from the tanks down to the greenhouse, where they mix it with the water from the wells and the irrigation ditch. And they reduced the salt so much that they reduced their plant death to just 10%, not 80%. Okay. Yeah. Scusa. Poi puoi ritornare all'altra diapositiva? quella dei 170 metri cubi. Can you go back to the other slide about 170 cubic meters? Uh, which yes. one was that? It's just before it. Sì. Right yes. Ah, there. Okay. Eh, no, il serbatoio eh, quel serbatoio avrà una capacità di 10-20 metri cubi. Eh, Is that tank? Which tank? Quello o quello? Ah, sono due serbatoi. Yeah, uh huh. And then he has one of those? He has four of those. Ah, c'è quattro di quelli e quattro cinque di quelli. Ah, ah, ok. In tutto sono 500 metri cubi di capacità. So the total capacity of all the water he gathers is 550 square meters? No, that is the total area of his roof. Ah, ok. Yeah. Io volevo sapere la capacità dei serbatoi. Yeah, so that would be one, two, three, five. Uh, he has about uh, 10,000 gallons of. Uh, um, would that be right? Yes, 10,000 gallons of tanks capacity. So I'll try and convert that. 10,000. So 37,000 liters in tanks. What? Oh, so you mean for one? 
Um, but I, when I say gallons, I mean American, not English. So the conversion is 3.79. Oh, that's a smaller gallon? Yeah. So we have 37,000 liters of tank capacity. Quindi la stagione secca non è più di 5 mesi. So the dry season is not more than five months. Uh, okay, there they have rain in the winter and the summer. But no rain in the spring or the fall. Okay. Ha un'autonomia di cinque mesi, diciamo quattro mesi. So he is independent of four months. Yeah. Independent of rain. Yes. Uh, well, he, no, he has to be independent longer because we can have a drought. So uh, he, uh, he could have water uh, not for eight months. Um, and so what he is uh, planning to do now to give him a buffer in drought years is to build a rain barn, okay, which is a building for his tools, his vehicles, uh, which he doesn't really need for his tools or his vehicles. He just wants more roof so he can uh, collect wa more water. Okay. Uh, this is in New York City, uh, in Brooklyn, and uh, New York is a very wet climate, um, much colder, and uh, they have many community gardens throughout the city, but during a drought year, the mayor threatened to shut off the water to all the community gardens. Um, because they get their water, they used to get their water for free from the fire hydrant. Uh, they would open the fire hydrant and then with the hose, they would fill these barrels at the end of each garden plot. And then the gardeners would fill a watering can from the barrel and water their garden uh, in the summer. Uh, but when the mayor threatened to shut off the water, they, like, what do we do? So they put gutters on the roofs of the buildings on either side of the garden and then put in uh, tanks and now that is their primary water source. Okay, uh, which is also helping reduce flooding of the garden in the wet times. <laughs> okay. Uh, in some areas, you can get a discount on your uh, property insurance, your home insurance, if you have a backup water supply for fire suppression. Okay. So if you put in a rainwater tank whose water is dedicated just for an emergency, and you put a valve that is the right size for your local fire truck, uh, you can get a 50% reduction in your insurance. And in uh, Seoul, South Korea, that is very wet, <laughs> there is a program to put three cisterns underneath every building. 
And the idea is to have a tank for me, a tank for you, and a tank for everybody. So the tank for me is me to have water whenever I want, to use how I want. Uh, the tank for you is a tank that will hold water that would otherwise go down hill and flood somebody, okay? Like maybe you. <laughs> and the tank for everybody is always full of water and reserved just for emergencies, like an attack from North Korea <laughs> or an earthquake or a fire. Um, so it's much better to have many tanks full of water throughout the city rather than being reliant on one municipal water system. Okay. Uh, in Amman, Jordan, very dry uh, climate, uh, Amman is uh, up in the high country, well above the Jordan River, and uh, they are pumping the water uphill from the Jordan Valley, an elevation rise of 1,300 meters, and this costs so much energy that that is 17% of the nation's energy production just goes into moving water. Okay. And Jordan does not have oil, does not have its own energy source. It must buy its energy from outside. It could do solar. It has a lot of sun. <laughs> um, so uh, when I was uh, teaching in Jordan, the thing I kept pointing out to them is just like here, more rain falls on the city than the entire city of people consumes of imported water. <laughs> they consume 130 liters of water per person per day, but they have 430 liters of rainwater per person per day. if they could capture that water and spread it out through the year. And uh, there actually is a law that everyone must build a tank in their basement. But nobody enforces the law. Okay. Um, I have a question? Yeah. Um, uh, which is the, the amount of collectible... Oh, wait, microphone. Oh. Uh, in Italian. Qual è in, in media la quantità di acqua uh, che è possibile raccogliere in percentuale rispetto alla quantità di acqua che cade su una città? Uh, do you have data about uh, which is the uh, uh, amount of water which is collectible, uh, the ratio of collectible water and the uh, rain water that fall on a town? Uh, ah, okay. So that, um, that depends. So yeah, if, you, if you push your uh, water harvesting as much as possible, which, which is the ratio uh, of water that you can collect uh, uh, and the water that actually fall uh, on a top? I would say we could collect 90%. 90%. Okay. Uh, so in tanks, I think it would make the most sense to collect water from rooftops because that water is the cleanest, because cows don't fly, so there's no cows shitting on the roof. Okay. Yeah. There are birds. Yeah. No. Yeah, in the city that's more the case, is the cars don't fly. Okay. And then for the street runoff, uh, if there is enough unpaved land, we can do the rain gardens. 
um, and porous pavement if we need. Um, but uh, we could also do some tanks collecting water from those surfaces, but we need to do more filtration. So I can tell the major of my town 90% if you... It's possible. Uh, but uh, in some cities, it's more possible than others because of how they're built. All right. Um, when I went north of Amman, um, I came upon a number of villages that so valued their rainwater that they would never consider making tea or food or drinking anything but rainwater. And in fact, if you were to offer someone tea made from you, the utility water, it would be like someone spit in your tea. It would be uh, uh, very offensive. Um, so uh, I love that in the culture there is still this value of the tea, and it was really good. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, rain, well, in Jordan, all the tea is super sweet. <laughs> There's so much sugar. Uh, but rainwater is known around the world as sweet water. And that is because it does not contain the salts and the minerals that groundwater or surface water does. Um, and it's just like here, same type of cisterns um, that we looked at by the road, this shape. Um, and, uh, um, but there, they didn't have a pump. They are just using a can on a rope to get the water. Do they filter the water in any way before they drink it? Uh, all, all it is, is, is it's something like this. It's, here, the water's coming through a channel, and they have some limestone gravel that the water runs through, and along with the sediment traps, that's their only filtration. Okay. Uh, and what I really loved is how when people, there are so many rainwater cisterns throughout Jordan, Syria, Palestine, um, Saudi Arabia, that uh, when people dig a foundation for a house or start to dig a hole for a tree, they very often find cisterns <coughs> okay, that are filled up with garbage and dirt. So, a number of NGOs, non-government organizations, such as the Mercy Corps, are showing people how to clean out and repair the cisterns, and then direct their roof runoff into the cistern so they can use that water as their drinking water in the house, their primary water in the house. And what I loved about this is it is a direct connection of the past to the present. And these ancient water harvesting strategies, I mean, these are Roman and Byzantine era cisterns. And they're just as valuable and useful today as they were when they were originally built. Um, but uh, as is the case in much of the world, these water harvesting traditions were uh, started to get abandoned when piped water uh, became available. And then people were attracted to the convenience of the faucet, and they forgot about where their water came from. But in India, where they have incredible water harvesting traditions, 
they are finding that many of the municipal utility, water utility systems are going dry in dry years because they've abandoned the traditional water harvesting systems that used to help recharge the water table. And so now there are a number of campaigns underway in India to revive these ancient water harvesting systems to help recharge the water table which feeds the pipes. Okay? That was a little bit of a tangent story. All right. <laughs> um, but uh, the only thing different here from the Roman era is they have a sump pump to get the water into the house. Yeah? Would those cisterns still be in good condition? Yeah, they're, they just need to replaster the interior. That's it. And clean them out. So uh, they are even building uh, new cisterns in the same way that they used to. So uh, um, we came upon this crew of uh, Egyptian workers, uh, and they have a tripod over the hole, which they run the bucket down to fill the soil, this, um, pull it out, and they are doing the same, they're making these the same way that the Romans did, except they now have a jackhammer. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, so it takes uh, a crew, uh, a crew of four, they build 35 of these cisterns each year. Uh, and uh, I, I just thought this was amazing. So I ran up and I asked, can I go in? Can I go in? And uh, they said, sure. So I grabbed the rope and <laughs> went down and, oh, it was so good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. They thought I was crazy, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, this is in another part of Jordan, where uh, they are um, reviving old cisterns, but also building new ones, and a big reason why they must do this in Jordan is, uh, like much of the world, the water utility water is so uh, unreliable, you might get water once a week for a few hours, or maybe once every three weeks for a few hours. So um, people typically have a tank with the faucet open, just so when the utility water appear, comes on, they can fill a tank, okay? Um, but uh, nobody likes the quality of that water. It doesn't taste good, it smells, it's salty. Um, so uh, uh, more and more people are putting in rainwater tanks. And uh, Johud, another NGO, they uh, are very smart when they work with communities. They try to find the community leader and see if they are interested in a tank. And if they are, they build a tank with them. And then they spread the word to the rest of the community. So their community uh, leader and spiritual leader, their imam, they worked with him to put in the tanks. And when he gave his approval, this is good, everyone in the village wanted the tanks. Okay. And, uh, and he uh, said, too, you know, this, the rainwater, it is the best because this is the water from Allah, God. And uh, that's the ultimate stamp of approval. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, so they collect the rainwater from their roof in a tank under their terrace, their patio, just like out here. And that is the water for the household. 
They have another tank here that collects water from the landscape, like the driveway. And that is the water for their uh, or, ol olive orchard. Sa se se e come rivestono internamente la cisterna da quelle parti? Can you tell us, or do you know uh, how they um, line the inside of the cistern in Jordan? Yeah. So the uh, the old-fashioned style, um, that's Roman cement. Okay, I forget how you make all that. I need to get the uh, recipe. But it's the exact same cement with the limestone that all the ruins here were made of. Okay, yeah. So perhaps you, perhaps your, your, your genetics uh, taught the people in the Middle East, okay? So you have a connection, a cultural connection to that. Um, so the new cisterns, they use Portland cement. Uh, it's co modern concrete, modern cement. And they, uh, they then seal it with uh, what we call, what I call Portland slip. It's just the cement mixed with water, no sand, no rock. It's just the cement. Over. <laughs> Okay. Is that healthy? Yeah, good. So, so cement lime cisterns are not bad for your health? No. Uh, unless. Okay, so the cisterne, the cisterne rivestite di cemento uh, possono essere nocive alla salute. Ha detto no, almeno che. You get cement made with fly ash which is from a waste product from coal burning plants. Because that's full of heavy metals. <laughs> So it's best 
to, uh, uh, if you can, you want to buy uh, cement that is rated for potable water collection systems. <coughs> but this is not always easy to find. You can buy cement sometimes, at least in the US, that is rated for use for potable water tanks. Okay, so can you see how there is a low spot in the collection area for uh, the tank that is under here? You can see the brown stain from the dirt. So that is their sediment trap. So when the water comes down here, it fills this whole area, and the sediment drops out before the water rises up, and the clean water goes in, cleaner water goes into the tank. All right. Uh, so that um, that leads us to nine uh, principles for harvesting water in cisterns. Okay. So the first one: make sure you have adequate inflow into your tank. So. I find many times people make the gutter too small and they make the downspout too small. So water oftentimes shoots <coughs> over the gutter instead of going into the tank. And your building codes give you uh, guidelines on appropriate sizing of gutter and downspout based on your rainfall. Uh, and I just realized this morning, I forgot to put that on my website, but in a month, I will have that information on the rainwater harvesting page of my website. I just forgot to put it there. Uh, second, um, we want to make sure we have adequately sized overflow. <coughs> and many times I find people don't have an overflow. Or the overflow pipe is a smaller diameter than the inflow pipe. the diameter of the inflow and the diameter of the overflow pipes should be the same. Uh, to, because when people make this too small, the water will back up and, against the house. Okay. Is that cl clear to everyone? <laughs> okay. All right. So then the third principle is we want to design a system to collect high quality water. So first, we select a roof material that is not toxic, okay? These stone roofs, the tile roof, it's great, no problem. Okay, concrete roof, no problem. But something that is very common in the United States, but I don't see much here, is asphalt roofs. You have it? Oh, okay. All right.
So you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fo another form of that. Okay, it's not. It's asphalt's not good. But uh, so asphalt roofs. Uh, asphalt roofs. Uh, you can harvest the water for irrigation and even drinking, but you must have an activated carbon filter to filter out the hydrocarbons coming off the asphalt. Okay? If you're going to drink it. You don't need that for the plants. Okay? Um, and in the United States, we have asphalt shingles, little sections of roof, like they're like tiles. <coughs> and the manufacturers put uh, poison in the shingles uh, to kill moss and to kill fungus, mushrooms. Um, so you need to filter that out too. All right. <coughs> so uh, a, you can buy paints to paint over your asphalt roof. We call these elastomeric paints. They tend to be light color. So it's good for this climate because it reflects the summer heat. And you can get these paints that are rated for drinking water collection. And on the rainwater harvesting page of my website, I have a materials page. And under that, a roofing materials page. And I have links to companies that sell these. Okay. Um, but I prefer a metal roof, a, uh, a galvalum steel roof. Okay. And uh, because it has clean water coming off, <coughs> it's reflective, so it cools me in summer. And I can get a fire insurance reduction because it doesn't burn. And the zinc is not a problem? Nope. So you and I, we are zinc deficient. Men are zinc deficient in dry climates. So it's all right. Yeah. Not if you have uh, wood underneath. Okay. Okay, in Australia, where there is a, still a very healthy tradition of harvesting rainwater, Roofing companies promote their products that are tested and rated for drinking water collection. So you can buy metal roofing that is stamped with a guarantee that it is good for rainwater collection. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> this, you also want to make sure your pipe your tank, it's all rated for drinking water collection. So some tanks are sold to collect gasoline or chemicals. 
very often the material in that plastic will contaminate your water. So you want a tank rated for drinking water collection. Next, we want to design a closed system so it passively filters itself. So here we have a tank that does not allow any sunlight in. So there's no algae, no green algae growing, <coughs> which could then die and stink. Okay? We don't let the birds in, so they can't poop in the water um, or any other creatures. Um, we, if we're going to drink this water, we don't let anybody swim in the water. Because if somebody swims in the water, this is a technical term, you add the butt crack factor. <laughs> yeah. The, the butt crack factor. Okay. Okay. There. <laughs> Yeah. All right. You also here where the water comes into the tank, we have a screen. So the leaves are cast off. The big debris, no animals can get in, no mosquitoes, but the water comes in. And we uh, we have the over we have the faucet at least 10 centimeters above the bottom of the tank. So the dust, whatever bird poop makes in, collects at the bottom and does not come out with the water. The worst quality water from a tank is the water you take out right after a rain. Because, uh, right after a rain, which is right after a long dry period. Because during the dry period, you have birds pooping on your roof, you have dust accumulating on your roof, maybe leaves falling. So when it finally rains, all that is washed off the roof. And then when it comes in the tank, it, there's turbulence. And all the nasty things on the bottom are churned up into the water. But if you just wait two or three days, it all settles out again, and you'll have much cleaner water. So, to work with this, when possible, I will have the inlet on one side of the tank and the outlet on the other side of the tank, just so there's a little more time for the water to settle out, the, the sediment to settle out before I take the water out. And if I had two tanks connected to one another, um, I would, uh, and they can be connected on the top. They pro sorry, they're probably connected more on the bottom. Okay. I would have my faucet here. Not here, because I would have most of the turbulence in this tank and most of the sediment in this tank, not this one. Okay? Why not put the tube on the top so you get the cleaner water into the second tank? Okay. Pretend on metal tube on the I can do that. But 
then I only get the overflow. And after I empty this tank, this is full of water, and I can't get this water over here. So you could do both. You could have only the overflow water in big rain events and have a second one here with a valve that you only turn on in mellow times when the rain's not coming in. OK. Um, closed system. All right, any questions on that part? Yeah. Oh, wait, they got <laughs> Potrebbe essere anche un sistema della seconda cisterna per un maggiore filtraggio dell'acqua, quindi per una maggiore pulizia, magari installando una cisterna più piccola davanti e poi quella più grande per la raccolta. No, Yeah. 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 Okay. So then the next is uh, we want to maintain access to the tank. So I always want, if my access is from the top, I want it big enough that I can get inside. So I can clean it, I can inspect it, and I, if it is an above ground tank, I want to be able to walk around the whole tank and inspect it for leaks. Um, but I will often put a lock on it or screws so a child cannot get in and drown and introduce the butt crack factor. Okay. Um, I w for a closed tank, I need a vent. Okay, so that could just be a uh, like a five millimeter hole with a screen on it. But in a big rain event, if lots of water is coming in and water is also overflowing, if it is an airtight tank, there is a risk that a vacuum will form and the tank will implode like a beer can, okay? And, uh, but just having a little vent, that's no problem. The old cisterns we saw on the road, they have a big vent because there's a big opening on the top. But that also lets rats fall in. That lets mosquitoes breed. Okay. Um, okay. The, uh, then we want to use gravity to our advantage. So uh, I always, when possible, want to use gravity to move the water into the tank and gravity to move it out of the tank. But if you have a tank below the ground, this might not be possible. That's okay. Just make sure that gravity is what lets the overflow water out of the tank. Do not design a tank that has an overflow dependent on a pump. Because if the <laughs> pump fails, you have no overflow. Okay. Uh, then we want to make rainwater harvesting uh, convenient. So lots of people in my city like to put in rainwater tanks because it's la moda. Okay? Um, but the... Li moda. Okay, sorry. You can tell I'm American. Okay. So the, uh, the tanks are full of water but they never use them. It's, so they're trying to be fashionably sustainable, 
but they're being ridiculously unsustainable. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, usually the reason for this is that the rainwater tank is using gravity pressure and the tank's faucet is far from where they want to use the water. Whereas the city faucet, the city water faucet, is closer to their garden and has higher pressure. So it's more convenient to use. So we need to place our tank and design our plumbing so rainwater is more convenient to use. I'll, I'll give some examples of that shortly. Uh, and then um, finally, you want to place your tank and design your tank in such a way that it does more than just harvest water. And I'll give some examples later. Okay. Any question on the principles before I continue? Riguardo i materiali, eh, prima abbiamo visto una slide in cui era stato messo un cellofan di plastica sul terreno. La plastica, mi chiedo, non è mh, dannosa, insomma, o non adatta per recuperare l'acqua? In quel caso era sul terreno, però non so. Uh. And so, a few slides back, you showed where the man in New Mexico had plastic down on the sides of his mm -hmm. greenhouse, mm -hmm. and she's saying, is, um, is it not unhealthy to gather water? Mm. So he is not drinking that water. Okay, uh, that's just for irrigation. Yeah. And if you're going to get a plastic tank, you must get a plastic tank rated for drinking water. Uh, and uh, you want a uh, dark, well, you want a, uh, uh, a, ta a plastic tank that does not allow sunlight in. That come out clear. If you've got um, a plastic tank that is suitable for drinking water, and you don't want that the sun uh, over time uh, rain your uh, tank, what is the best way to cover it to protect it from the sun? Se hai una, un serbatoio di plastica che è per acqua potabile e, ed è esposto al sole, qual è la maniera migliore per proteggerlo? So one thing is use your overflow water from the tank to infiltrate it in a rain garden next to the tank to grow a tree to shade and cool the tank. The cooler the temperature, you store your water, the higher the quality that stored water will be. But you will probably need to shade it even more. So you can paint the exterior of a plastic tank with elastomeric paint. <laughs> You, you could also grow vines around the tank. Uh, you could put shade structure around uh, other options. And I'll show you some other examples. 
Oh, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so this is what it looks like in a tank that gets sunlight. Can you see how green and dark that water is? So uh, we opened the lid, and this is a white plastic tank. And so a lot of sunlight comes through the plastic and is growing this algae. And they have this tank on the west side of their house. So it gets really hot. It really stinks. <laughs> yeah. Well, you come out a little green with this one. It's I have a, a tank on the roof for that purpose for showering. Mm -hmm. So, uh, rainwater is naturally soft. It does not have minerals in it. So, it is the best water for washing your hair. You do not need hair conditioner if you wash your hair with rainwater. It will soften your hair naturally. Another advertisement for rainwater. <laughs> ben, do we still have the shade that was on that one door? Because this is really hard to see. Um, okay, so this is how they uh, solved the problem. They shaded the tank and they also put shade cloth on top. But when I see this, I think it's a little ridiculous because if they had just purchased a tank that did not allow sunlight into the water in the first place, they would not need to buy the additional shading materials. Okay. sarebbe cioè, posizionarle al nord della casa di serbatoio all'ombra maybe if, if, you're, if you don't want the tank to get sunlight that can be a good place but um, in a cold climate that's not good because uh, you don't want freezing and let's say you have a concrete tank or a fiberglass tank, uh, that might be a benefit on the east or west to shade your house. Depends. So uh, the white PVC pipe, you never want to use this outside unless you paint the pipe because PVC or cover it somehow PVC pipe will turn brown when exposed to the sunlight and it is then possible to release lead into your water so what I heard from an Australian company that sells lead-free PVC is they told me that in some factories that make PVC pipe they use lead as the uh, 
lubricant or the material between the form that makes the pipe and the plastic. So some lead gets into the pipe. And uh, really, if it's written lead free. no, if it's, if it's PVC free, you're OK. <laughs> if it's lead free, you're OK. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, let me do a check-in here with you all and with the translator. Um, what I'm aiming for is to do a break at 11.30. It's now 11.15. But if you want to break now, we can break now. You're okay? Yeah. Okay, you guys are okay? Okay, so um, this is uh, a big building, collecting the rainwater off the building, and the gutter is sloped in this direction, not this direction. Okay? Here it's sloped this way. W why? Uh, that's great, I love that. Why? Why do I love that? Yes, but we could put the cistern here. But I love the location of that cistern. Exactly, yeah. So we are using the height of the roof to our advantage. So we move the water to the highest part of the landscape. And then we can use gravity to move it down to irrigate all of this with no pump. So exactly. All right. Do I need to go back? Uh, question. Yeah. Okay. So he, the water comes off the roof, and the gutter is sloped to drain the water to this side of the building, which is at the high point of the landscape. The landscape slopes this way. And the tank is put at the highest possible point. Is it good? Okay, all right. Uh, here at this co-housing development in Tucson, the water from this parking lot drains to a uh, basin. But the basin is too small. So in a big rain, the water backs up over half of the parking lot. So to address this problem, we wanted to harvest more of the water higher in the watershed. So uh, we made a curb cut for this planting area to let water in. And on the carport roof, here's the carport, here's the carport. We put gutters that slope this way. The land is sloping this way. The gutter is sloping this way. So we direct the gutter water to the high point of the landscape, which is here. And the ridge line is there. So the parking lot goes this way the landscape this way. So this water used to be a problem for here. Now it's a resource for here. Is that clear? All right. OK. So now I'll go into some tank system components. First, we need a roof. 
Simple, okay. So uh, now some roofs, now I'll do this later, never mind. Um, screening, okay. Then we have a gutter, then a downspout screen, then a pipe to the tank. We have an optional first flush. You don't have to do this, but uh, if you're going to drink the water, sometimes it's good. Because all the bird poop, the dust, everything that accumulates on the roof, in the first rain, it fills this pipe, and there's a cap on it. So the, the nasty water from the first flush fills it up. And then the cleaner water goes into the tank. But this only works if you let that water out after the rain. Okay. You could do that too, yep. Good point. Uh, you want to translate that? Oh, um, forse funziona meglio se il tubo con numero 4 viene direttamente, direttamente, direttamente giù dal punto 3. Uh, così non c'è rischio che l'acqua salta. salta um, sì, ok. Uh, sì. Tre parti. Sì. È so, uh, what's, what's uh, humorous and informative for me is when I watch uh, the Italian students explain things to one another, I realize I could use my hands a lot more to <laughs> describe how all of this works. So, I, I, I need to get better. I'm more like this when I talk. So. Okay, I will, I will try to work on that. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. And we'll look at some other options. So, okay. For the gutter screen, sometimes people have a screen over the whole gutter, or here, just a screen at the downspout opening. Um, I don't like this so much because I typically cannot see what, what's in the gutter. I don't know if the gutter screen is, is full or not. Um, and it's difficult for me to get to it and to clean it out. So I, I typically don't like the gutter screens. But, uh, and if you have a tree, oh, with branches over a roof, you're going to get this, like crazy. Um, so consider this when you plant your trees, when you're pruning your trees, and at the very least, before the rainy season, you must clean your gutters. And in India, in Palestine, in Jordan, the, in the culture, the job of the children is they must get on the roof and sweep it off and sweep out the gutter any time there is rain in the forecast. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I... <coughs> uh, 
Um, so I, uh, I like rain head screens um, better than gutter screens. So they are placed just under the gutter where the downspout pipe comes out. And they have a screen that's at an angle. So the leaves are cast off and the water comes through. This is much better than a gutter screen because it's somewhat self-cleaning. That is in this book right here. <laughs> and uh, also, if you go to the uh, image page, the uh, video, audio, image page of my website and click on images. I have a whole photo gallery of these screens. Okay. What an amazing website. Okay. <laughs> you can, you can uh, make or buy these rain heads so the pipe comes out the side. And that saves you elevation or height. Okay. <laughs> oh, rain head. Yeah, you don't have to call it a rain head. You could call it a downspout screen. Okay? But this, down, this downspout screen, I hate. I cannot stand it. Because you, we need to think about how things work. So here... The leaves are cast off. This is a nest. So it just, uh, it harvests leaves, okay? And other things. So when I was in Australia, uh, I was visiting everyone I could that had a water harvesting system. Because in some parts of Australia, such as South Australia, 93% of the people live on or with a rainwater harvesting system. Okay. So at this house, uh, they invited me in and said, would you like some rainwater? I said, yes. So, and I drank lots and lots of it because I was really thirsty. <laughs> Then <laughs> burped a little, and, uh, and I said, can I see your rainwater harvesting system? And they said, sure, come on out. So I'm going, and the water is sloshing in my stomach. And we get up here, and before I can take the picture, there are dozens of birds in here bathing around and, and, and shitting. And... Uh, um, and, uh, and, and mating, and uh, so I, uh, and all in the water, because the, the water level was very high. I was like, ah, oh, great. And uh, so I said, I asked him, what's that? Butt crack event. Yes, but a bird butt crack event. So I then asked him, do you have any filtration for this? And he said, well, yes, I have the sunscreen here. I said, okay. But do you have any other filtration? He said, and he said, yes, I have a rain head on the downspout. And I said, oh, good. Do you ever inspect it? He said, no. So I said, can we inspect it? Yes. And that's what we saw. Dead bird. <laughs> OK. All right. So uh, it's like, great. This is a true story. Yeah, yeah. But I, I didn't get sick, okay, thankfully. Um, so, uh, 
Another um, screen you can have if you have an underground tank, water uh, comes in and then, uh, uh, oh, no, sorry, water doesn't come in here, comes in here and then goes down. It has to go through this screen, which has many shelves of screens. So you open it, pull it out, flick out the stuff, put it back. Okay. But what I don't like about this, I will never know if it's clogged unless I look inside. Okay. And now we will look at the first flush. So, like you were saying, here's a better design. The water comes straight into the first flush. When it's full, it overflows to their underground rainwater tank. And this is in Hawaii, which has a lot of rain in this part of Hawaii. Very high quality water. And this swimming pool is only rainwater. Okay. Um, and uh, you see they have the asphalt shingle roofs. So I asked them, do you ever clean out your first flush? And I ask a lot of people that have a first flush if they ever clean out their first flush. And their typical answer is, my what? <laughs> and, uh, and their second answer is, I need to clean it? <laughs> so we opened it up, and just tons of black sludge came out. It was all full. Okay. So they should not have a first flush because they don't, they don't clean it. So every time it rains, that's mixing, okay? So this only works if you are going to empty it. So some people say, oh, well, you can put a little hole in the cap, and it'll just leak water. It might do that for the first and second rain, but then it will clog with all the stuff that's accumulating. So, so I find, yeah, you have to clean it. So I clean, opened one of wait, those. Wait. Uh, I opened one of those in a house where some people were staying, and as you said, a lot of black shit came out. And they said, oh, that's horrible. Don't do that again. And I said, well, <laughs> would you prefer it in the cistern? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is uh, my uh, setup, and if you want to see this in action, you can uh, go to my YouTube page or my website and see the video of this. Okay, so uh, here are my two plastic tanks, which are rated for potable water collection. They're supposed to be light-proof tanks, but I went inside while a friend was waiting outside and I closed the lid with me inside. And I could see my hands. It's like, this is not a light proof tank. So I then painted it. And I painted it a lighter color so it reflects some of the heat because I'm in a hot climate. And I wanted it to match the house so my neighbors would like it. Okay, so we collect water off the roof through the gutter. Then we have a rain head screen, so the leaves come off. What? The water comes down. My first flush fills up 
and then the water goes into this tank, and I collect the water out of this tank. Okay? And uh, to make this work, I purposely put the first flush where I can see it from my door and where my patio where I sit and drink and talk. And I planted a grapevine. And I love grapes. I, and if I want to eat grapes, I must water the grape. So here is the water that's full of bird poop, which grapes love. <laughs> So it's convenient for me to do this. If I put this around the corner, I would never empty it. So you have to make it convenient. OK. I think we're now 11.30. Yep. OK. So now we're at uh, 11.30. So yeah, we have a question first. Il tubo che c'è lì sulla sinistra, che sale verso la grondaia, stando alla freccia, che cosa è? Where is your... Very good. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, and that leads to the next slide. But uh, basically, um, I have two systems that are putting water into the tank. One is a dry system where the water comes off the roof into the gutter and directly into the uh, cistern. No water sits in this part of the pipe. So except for this, the pipe is always dry between the rains. And this is the best, the dry system is the cleanest, lowest maintenance system when you don't have this in place, okay? But uh, sometimes I want to move cistern water a long distance from uh, maybe one roof to a tank 100 meters away. So I could do that overhead in an aqueduct. <coughs> or if I am in a warm climate, I can send the pipe down underground and then back up and into the tank. So I am collecting water from the other house and the other house, its gutter, is at a higher elevation than this gutter. So the whole pipe fills with water and then overflows here. So let me show you. Oops. So. Um, <coughs> This is like, this is the wet system. So the pipe fills with water and then overflows into the tank. But this is always full of water. Unless somebody drains it between rains. And that's why it's called a wet system. Okay, but a bet, this thing, it, that's, that's a, ignore it. It's confusing, ignore it. This is a dry system where the water always goes to the tank. And in a cold climate, you cannot do this. Yeah, your pipes will freeze. 
In a cold climate, this is great. As long as you do not have the first flush. Because the first flush will freeze in the cold season. So you don't have to have a first flush. Okay. And if you're not going to clean it, you do not want it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, is, that, is that clear? Yeah. Oh, wait. So let me just show one other thing. So one other thing. Uh, where is the overflow? You always need an overflow. <laughs> yeah, right there. OK. And then it goes, well, you have to see. The, I think the overflow is really cool. But you have to see the video to know where it goes. OK, so then you. Nel sistema basi comunicanti, the wet system, uh, ci sono dei problemi di scolo delle acque in base alla quantità di acqua che il tetto raccoglie e la velocità con cui i vasi comunicanti riescono a trasportare l'acqua, ovvero bisogna proporzionare i tubi a seconda della portata del tetto per uh, affinché i vasi comunicanti siano efficaci e che la grondaia non, uh, non trabocchi? Can you tra translate? Uh, basically, for the wet system, uh, is there any calculations to do in order to have the pipes that do the, where, the, where the water is at level, basically, uh, in order to make the water all run through the pipes rather than have an overflow into the gutters. Basically, is the water fast enough into the piping system? Or we need to actually calculate yeah. the... So there are calculations, um, but I have found they're not very good. Um, the main thing you need to keep in mind is if you size your gutter and downspout to the size that your building code says is correct for your rainfall, you should be fine as long as you minimize the number of bends. Because for every bend, you're increasing surface friction. And if you have a lot of bends, you want to go up a size in pipe. Yeah, the length also will increase. So. Your surface friction. Perciò c'è una differenza tra l'acqua in caduta libera in una grondaia e i vasi comunicanti. È molto è più lenta l'acqua negli spostamenti. The water is lower into the communicating system. Yes, it has to be. It has to. And it's good to be at least uh, what would six inches be? So three, four, at least 150 millimeters lower would be good. Um, but if the cistern is close enough, you could cheat. Um, but I would want, at minimum, uh, six, uh, 150 millimeter difference. OK. All right. So uh, with that, let's, uh, let's take a break. Yeah, I just planned a, a trip to Matera. Okay. Uh, I uh, I have a friend that is a guide, so he can oh, wow. uh, bring us under the beneath the nice. uh, the ground level and uh, go there to visit the sisters, the sisters out of the town. Awesome. Great. And uh, we can do uh, two, three hours trip. Okay. Sassi, which is uh, the old uh, the ancient part of the town, and visit the sisters.
Do you want to make your announcement? Yes. Allora, just una cosa molto piccola. Per domani, come avevo detto ieri, ho chiesto una piccola gita a Matera, per chi vuole. C'è una guida, c'è una guida che può guidarci a vedere sotto gli indizi di raccolta che ci sono sotto il livello della piazza, che sono molto antichi, sono dei grandi reali cisterne di raccolta delle acque e ci può far fare un giro uh, nei sassi per vedere gli antichi di raccolta delle acque, le canaline, le cisterne delle case. Uh, credo ci sia, c'è anche un posto di serie con vicino di Sant'Antonio che ha un'inclinazione um, delle abitazioni che è fatta apposta per raccogliere il sole durante l'inverno, i raggi solari. E potrebbe essere interessante anche che ci sarà una vestita su quella sulla parte lì. Uh, per la guida non c'è problema, l'ho già, già affrontata io, l'ho dato io. E per spostarvi verso la terra non so cosa potreste fare. Per il pranzo posso prenotare da qualche parte se, se voi volete, ci sono due posticini simpatici, l'osteria eh, dove ci si può sedere, stare tranquilli, è eh, tutto perfetto, no? assolutamente, e poi c'è anche una, un po' più fast food, la cui comunque la roba locale, si fa, cioè, sono più veloce. Però dalle 12 e mezza, perché sono radio, dalle 12 e mezza, allora, eh, questa guida è sotto i palombari dalle, eh, da tutta la mattinata per fare le guide, sotto questi cisterne. Noi sarebbe meglio che andassimo verso le 12 in maniera che lui dopo l'una può portarci fuori dalle cisterne a vedere le altre cose nei sassi, ci può fare la guida anche nei sassi. Quindi alle 12 per me è l'orario migliore, dovreste essere a chi vuole la materia. Se mi dite chi siete, quanti siete, posso anche eventualmente prenotare e chiedere allo scritto di maniera aperta fino alle 3, perché andiamo a pranzare alle 3. Eh, allo scritto si paga, proprio prendendo prima e secondo, una ventina di euro a testa. C'è acqua nel biglietto? No, 15. 15, 15, ma 20 non trovo esagerando. Vai, e you going? Oppure da Tuglio ci vuole prendere un pure sulla Yeah, do it, yeah, very much. Da Tuglio è una gastronomia, di Quindi domani, per chi può, chi vuole, chi può, chi vuole. Ma c'è qualcun altro che fa bene? Magari a fine giornata, io non sono sicuro di rimanere fino alla fine della giornata, perché no, no, magari la persona non sono sicuramente qua. Poi c'è calcolo. Però magari la sola fine della giornata la mattina prendiamo una visione, così nel caso di prenotare, prenotiamo. E, e comunque lo dico anche alla guida così organizza per quanti siamo. Quindi la visita sarebbe da una. Dalle 12, dobbiamo stare alle 12 lì alle 3, le 2, le 3. Poi pranzo e poi. Esatto. Che alle 2 penso che sia sufficiente, insomma di pranzo e poi magari ci spargiamo le sassi per farci un giro così o oh, andiamo di cuore va al mare perché magari è una bella domanda eh, 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 for example uh, the, uh, the seaside is quite near to the uh, last quarter of the first half so nice okay. excellent eh, <laughs> <laughs> quindi magari ci vedete un attimo a fine mattinata grazie grazie ok Um, <laughs> so Ben uh, shared this with me and apparently this is very easily available locally uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a local version of the first flush. Um, so the water all goes down the pipe from the gutter to the cistern, but um, if you are here when it rains, you can pull it out so that the first flush of water will not go to the tank. And after you let the dirty water flow, You can close it up and the water goes to the tank. You have to do it under the water. When yeah, it's raining. under the when gutter. Raining, when it's raining. Yeah. Sì, 
consigli automatici per farlo, per questo c'è dei consigli automatici su internet, si trovano, sono automatici, poi c'è il sensore pioggia oh, e cambia la So Ben was also saying that you can get this in whatever shape you want. So you could have it open up and there would be a silhouette of birds pooping into the water you shed away. And then when it's closed, you could have angels filtering the water. <laughs> okay, he didn't say that part. No. Okay. All uh, right. Now, I got the sense that many of you were very enamored with the wet system. Okay? So, uh, I just want to make it clear that while, yes, this, this can be a very good system, it is definitely more maintenance than this system. So, I prefer this system uh, when it makes sense because it's self-cleaning. I will never have freezing problems. But the wet system, if I don't forget, if, if, if I don't remember to clean it out occasionally, I will get all my sludge accumulating in this pipe. Okay. And I cannot see as easily a leak in this pipe as I can in this one. Okay. So as long as you know its strengths and weaknesses, you can decide what is appropriate for your situation. But when the tank is a far distance away from the gutter, uh, sometimes this is, makes more sense. So there's nothing overhead. But if you have the resources, you can make a beautiful aqueduct <laughs> going to the cistern. Okay. So now some other tank uh, components. Um, tanks. <clears throat> For above ground tanks, there are many options. Um, in my city, something that's very popular, I think for fashion reasons mostly, are these tanks. It's a metal pipe that has been put vertical into a concrete base. So you turn a drainage pipe into a harvesting tank. Okay. Um, it is, it has almost always leaks in two places, okay? Where the metal meets the concrete base. And in the, uh, the spiral seam between the sheets of metal. <clears throat> so you can use a caulking to seal it. And we use a rubber paint called Blue Max to paint the interior. <clears throat> um, you can also buy uh, kits where you put the rings together and then insert a plastic bladder. And these are very high capacity cisterns. <clears throat> uh, the nice thing is the metal does not break down in the sun um, and uh, so yeah it's good then there's fiberglass um, okay. uh, it tends to have high quality water and it is easy to fix Okay. Uh, whatever, ah, oh, forgot to mention that. Okay, I did not read my 
my note. <laughs> it's important with an above ground tank that the height not be more than twice the width. Because if it's too narrow and too tall, it can very easily fall. And even when you do it correctly, if the base of the, of the ground where you put the tank is not compacted and stable, it can become the leaning tower of water. Uh, and that's very dangerous because water is very heavy. So the way this was fixed is they dug a hole on the, on the low side, put a truck jack in there, and jacked the tank up, and then packed uh, a special fill dirt and compacted it, and then let it back. And it worked OK. In the urban environment, where you do not have much space, you can do narrow tanks. OK? They're called slim tanks. But you need to be extra careful that it has a, a good foundation. And you can make a whole wall or fence of tanks. But they, they don't have very good capacity. They're, they're not that big. Um, uh, a plastic tank. Here, they're starting to grow the vines to shade it. Um, they just uh, wrapped it with this steel mesh and put strips of wood between the metal mesh and the plastic tank. That's the wood. Okay. So the metal doesn't cut the tank? Is that what you said? That, that's, yeah, OK. This is a stone tank. You could do this here. You have beautiful limestone. Um, and then it has the aqueduct downspout. Um, something that I love about your underground tanks is it provides you with a building material. It's great. No waste. It's just a lot of work. <laughs> That's why nobody needs to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, here we have the slim tanks as a privacy wall. Okay. Another nice wall. And here they did not put the tank level, it was tilted, and it was not a strong foundation, and it went into the neighbor's house. Okay. So you have to do it right. Uh, here we have a bladder tank that can go under a floor of a house where you don't have much space. So when there's no water, it And then when there's water, it fills up. It's a bag, a water purse. OK. Um, so uh, and, and what is that? It's a bird nest. OK, that's the, that's the rain head I hate. Yeah, it's horrible. OK, I have to tell this story. So I, I, 
I met the president and the owner of the company that makes these in Australia. And I spent two days with them uh, exchanging ideas of how they could make products <laughs> better and how they could make new products. And because they make this horrible one, but they also make the good one. And at the end, I finally felt comfortable enough that I thought I could speak my mind to them. And I said, why do you sell this piece of shit? <laughs> yeah. And uh, they said, because, because we sell lots of them. And I said, OK. <laughs> do you feel good about that? that you're spreading shit throughout the world? <laughs> um, and they said, no, but, it, you know, it brings in money. So I said, OK, well, as long as you make those, I will tell my students about your good products and your shit products <laughs> so that they don't they don't buy it. But, uh, but the, okay, the point of the story is you can't trust what a company says about its product. Um, and uh, if a company is selling a tank that's <coughs> rated for potable water, I don't trust it unless a th neutral third party gave the certification. If the company gave the certification, I don't believe it. Because maybe their motivation is money and not good product. OK. Uh, other plastic tanks. Yeah. Yeah. These plastics are made to be light proof. And they are. Um, these short tanks, um, they might make sense where you have a house on a hill. And you could put the tank there. So the water in, water out with gravity. But on a house, on a flat site, a short tank, I think, is stupid. Because here we have this wonderful height, this elevation, from which we can direct the water anywhere to any point below that. But if we put the water into a low tank, now we can only direct the water to all points lower than this when it's full, or just here when it's empty. So I prefer a tall tank as high as I can get it. So when it's full of water, I can move that to many different areas. And I also have more water pressure. Because the, the higher the height of the water, the more pressure. <coughs> OK. Um, you can paint your tank so it doubles as artwork or a sign. In Austin, Texas, uh, you are, like most places in the United States, you get taxed for your signs. If you put up a sign for a business, they, sign, they tax you for the sign. But if your sign is painted on a water tank, there's no tax. Okay. Yeah. It, it's a way to tax a business. 
Yeah. Do you, do you make sign for your own on your wall inside your court here? Oh, no. On, only if you can see it by the public. OK. Uh, this is your access hole and the lid for a tank. It's locked. This is at a school, so no kids will drown. This is uh, friends of mine. They bought a house that had a cistern in the middle of the house. The water comes from the roof through a pipe into the tank. So I love how connected they are with their water because their only water source is the rainwater. And when the water level gets low in the tank, they take fewer showers. They uh, use less water, they conserve because they see they have to. Um, you can't see the covering. There's no cover. Yeah, like a swimming pool. Okay, good. Mosquitoes. So. They, uh, but the tank is inside the house, and they have screens on the windows and the doors. So they, they did not have any problems with mosquitoes getting into the water because they did not let mosquitoes into the house. But then one year, Not, not he, and this is a very dry climate, so it's, uh, it's okay. But, the, but that's a good concern you have, okay? I'm showing this slide because I want you guys to bring up these potential problems. Um, so for the mosquitoes, they had no problem until there was a drought year and they ran out of water. So they had to purchase water from a water truck. And the water truck dumped the water in, and the water was full of mosquito larvae. So they then threw mosquito-eating fish into the water. And then no problem. OK? Um, The fish poop floated to the bottom. Can you think of any other issues you might have with this tank? This is uh, ferro-cement, concrete over a steel frame. Ah, I think, you're I think you're saying what I think you're saying. You said it gets cold? Se ha un clima, se ha un clima molto arido può essere utile per refrigerare la casa. Ah, okay. So, yeah, in summer, in summer it's wonderful because it's a nice cool breeze coming off the water, nice and comfortable. And <coughs> Uh, they don't have algae because no direct sunlight gets into the tank, okay? okay? But your point, in summer it's wonderful. What might it be like the rest of the year? What about winter? Oh, 
uh, uh, they, have, they did not have a problem with humidity or condensation, but they did have a problem in winter when they have cold rain. They have all this cold water coming into the house, and they could never get warm because this was a big mass of cold. Um, so, many people have made this mistake, including some famous houses called Earth Ships in New Mexico. Earth Ships. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to. I'll explain. I'll explain. And an Earth ship is a house made of thrown away tires that are packed full of earth and then laid and then laid in arcs facing the winter sun and they have a greenhouse window on the south side and And these earth ships were supposed to be sustainable houses. They collect the rainwater from the roof for the people inside. They produce their own power with solar panels. They treat their wastewater through wetlands, uh, all this. But they, when they first started to build the houses, they put tanks inside the houses. And, and same situation, everybody froze in winter. So now the tanks are always outside. Okay. All right, you can do ferro cement. This is, uh, they make a steel skeleton. And, and then they plaster on or they blow the concrete onto it, and it's this thick. The people make boats the same way. Okay, And you can make it look like the urn, or a boulder, or a Mickey Mouse, <laughs> whatever you want. Okay. 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 It's, yeah. it's reinforced concrete. Same thing. <laughs> okay. Now, below ground tanks. Uh, so, the white plastic is fine if it's below ground. And, uh, okay, you know in America, people are crazy about guns, yeah? So, oh, wait, just a, so many of these tank installing companies make money by installing underground tanks where people can keep their guns. Okay. I just want to speak about something. With the tank outside, like the concrete one in stone, which will be really nice here because we've got a lot of stone. But as it's a construction, you need a permit. Uh -huh. And that's the other one we just see. 
So, I mean, I will prefer to do it in stone, but you're going to have to ask a DA, I think it's as clear, you have to pay for the, mm. because it's like constructing something. Mm. So make the point that plastic one or another one that you can disconnect, is not construction, you mm. can do it for free. Yeah, you want to tell, <laughs> translate? Okay, uh, okay. alors si tu fais une citerna en pietra, oui, comme tu fais une cosa, que es plus ou moins comme un muro à sec ou une casa, tu dois faire une autorisation, une adia, que tu dois payer, ok? Et que quand il euh, que si tu le fais en plastique, il est possible de faire sans ça, ni une autorisation. Um, this is a pre cast or pre-made concrete tank to go underground. Put in one piece and then another and seal the seam between the two. Uh, and that's how it is delivered on the truck. And there is a similar tank underground here. So below ground tanks are a good idea when you don't have a lot of space or land. So you can put the tank under a walkway or a driveway <laughs> where you're not growing anything. Okay. Um, this is popular in the US. Uh, it's a lot of boxes that are hollow inside. Okay. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a box of air and they build a rectangle tank of hollow boxes and then they wrap it in PVC sheets, okay. Uh, it's not very expensive, but I don't like it. Because you cannot get inside the tank. You can't fix it from the inside. If an animal chews through or somebody punctures, you can't get to it. And I don't like PVC either, so. Um, okay, this is really important. When you put your faucet coming out of your tank, you want to use what I call a full port valve. Okay, meaning the opening does not get smaller in the valve. This is good, this is bad. See how at the valve, the opening shrinks down, okay? So if you are using gravity to distribute the water out of your tank, when the tank is low in water, it will come out very slow from this valve. But if you use this valve, it'll come out very fast. So I like to do a 25 millimeter valve. Okay? I, I don't want smaller. Okay? That way, I always have really nice flow of water. Okay? Normally, in Italy, they use this kind. This kind? Good. Okay. Um, all right. In cold climates, um, 
many times if you have a big tank above ground, it won't freeze unless it's on the north side of the house. Because during the day, it gets above freezing for a long enough time that uh, it doesn't all freeze. Some water at the very top and on the side might freeze, but the whole tank usually does not freeze. But if you're in Norway or Sweden, then it will freeze. But here it will not. Um, but uh, if in the winter months you get snow and your ground freezes, then it is a good idea to have a valve that lets the water out of your tank below the frost line. Okay? And here, the valve is in a tube that they pack with insulation. So, just before freezing weather, they turn off the valve so no water comes out of the tank. And then the pipes in the yard, they empty them of all their water for the winter. So the small pipes in the yard never freeze. That's... You have to empty just the water in the pipes, not in the tank. Right. Okay. That's the easiest way to do it. And if in the winter months the tank is full of water and the snow on your roof melts and more water comes in, that's why you have the overflow. So no problem. Okay. With plastic tanks, if you are very careful, you can bury part of them. The, the manufacturer hates this. They don't want you to do this. But if you're very careful, you can do it. So this tank comes down to here in the ground. And so it's got more protection in the winter. So you have to fill it with water and then slowly backfill it with dirt. If you backfill it when the tank is empty, this is when you install it, it will collapse. Okay. All right. What if you put plastic what? Cisterns completely underground. I would only do that with cisterns that are made to be underground. Otherwise, they will crush. It has to be corrugated. Okay. This is a family or a couple that lives in New Mexico and uh, they get about 300 millimeters of rain a year, I seem to remember. Um, and they are on uh, point 0.1 of a hectare of land. They have about 300 square meters of roof. They have about 19,000 liters of capacity in their tanks. And almost all the water they use to irrigate their garden comes from rainwater. <coughs> and they sell their produce, their vegetables to restaurants, the farmer's market. Okay. 
Um, so here is one of their tanks and they use gravity to move the water to their garden. The, uh, they plant on raised beds. So they have uh, what we call tea tape, irrigation tape, okay. that they put It's drip, it's drip irrigation tape. We call it tea tape. It, it, you buy it flat. But it can fill with water. So they put that 10 centimeters below the surface of their raised bed. And then they grow all their vegetables as seedlings in the greenhouse. And then they plant the seedlings in their raised beds. And they irrigate with a watering can the rainwater from the tank. And once the roots have grown down to the tea tape, it's all gravity through the tea tape to the roots. So they lose less water to evaporation. Didn't get that. <laughs> if you want to try. germogliare tutti i semi nella serra, poi trapiantano le piantine nell'orto in orti rialzati da terra. L'innaffiano con l'acqua piovana con l'innaffiatoio. Quando hanno fatto le loro radici, allora usano questo coso che hai detto tu come l'ala gocciolante che sta sotto terra, fanno con la, la forza di gravità porta l'acqua piovana nell'ala gocciolante alle piantine. They've already put those underground before they do everything else, right? Sì, l'hanno già preparati sotto terra. How deep? How deep? 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters sotto il suolo. So is the pressure enough to... Yes. Okay. No. No. They're, they're, they're not planting trees and shrubs. They're planting annual vegetables. So at the end of each season, the tomatoes die. And if their roots had started to go into the tea tape, they're now dead. So they start anew. Okay. Okay. So since the tea tape is below the ground, they lose less water to evaporation. And then they cover their crops with shade cloth to further reduce evaporative loss. Since they are using drip irrigation line, it's very important that they have the filter between the tank and the irrigation line. Okay. Um, and this is another example at a different site doing rainwater with a, a different filter before it goes to the irrigation line. Okay. Um, now, you are looking at their garden beds, there is the tank at the high part of the property. Here is another tank. And with gravity, they move the water from their roof along the fence and into the tank. So they keep the water high. And then the tank 
Is it the high part of the property? So gravity moves the water downhill. So you, the system cost them 8,000 US dollars. 1,500 for, for the tanks. Oh, ah, there. 4,000 for the gutters. 300 for the drip irrigation. But now that it's set up, they make $5,000 a year selling their vegetables. But they bought everything new. If they had done work like the guy with the greenhouse, <laughs> they would have a much less expensive system. Uh, now, a problem with a gravity-fed irrigation system is you might turn on the valve from the cistern to water your garden or trees, and everything is good, but then someone calls you, hey, Brad, come over here. Oh. And then you forget <laughs> that the water is running. And then two days later, you're talking to a friend about a good meal you had or something, and all of a sudden, ah! I forgot the water! <laughs> and you go running home, and you turn off the water, but it's too late. All the water's been emptied. So, when I turn on the valve for my cistern, I put a kitchen timer around my neck. This is my brother. And, uh, and it's just ticking. And so then my friend calls me, hey, Brad, come over. Oh, hey. <laughs> and we start talking about whatever. And they're like, do you want to look like Flavor Flav of Public Enemy? Why do you have that? <laughs> I don't know if that would make sense. <laughs> okay. And, uh, so then I said, ah, don't worry, it's just going to remind me to turn off the water. And we talk, and then, and then I go and turn off the water. Oh, it's good. You can, yeah, you can also get a timer, but with a gravity-fed system, you cannot use a timer for a drip irrigation system that is made for pressurized water. Most timers are made for a, a steady pressure. But in a gravity-fed cistern, the pressure is always changing based on how much water is in the tank. So you need to get a spring-loaded timer, a timer that is like th this. It's, it's a spring, uh, so that um, the tension of the spring will turn off the timer, okay? Not a clock. Does that make sense? You don't understand what a spring is? It, well, the spring, when I say spring, I mean a spring like that. Okay. So, um, a, a normal drip irrigation timer works on a clock and but it also has a sensor and if it senses that the pressure changes a fair amount it will either shut off or it won't shut off because it it it's used to a regular pressure yeah but the, the, the inexpensive spring timers don't understand pressure. They it doesn't affect them. Okay. Um, okay, we good? All right. This is my uh, house uh, in the winter uh, when we have our winter garden. And all the pathways are raised to drain the water to the sunken plantings. And 
There we have the cisterns on the west side to block out the hot afternoon sun. But the, here what I want to talk about is when I put this cistern in, I had a pathway system in my garden that radiated in this direction. Because my thinking was I could come from the house and I could go to any part of the garden. Very easy. And, and right here, just outside the photo, is the faucet from the utility water. Okay? And, uh, but I put this cistern in so I would irrigate the garden with rainwater, not utility water. And so uh, a month after I put the cistern in, it was full of water. And I was irrigating my garden with city water, with the utility water, water utility water, not the rain water. And I'm watering there, and I'm thinking, but very slowly. <coughs> And I look at the cistern, and I look at my hand and the hose, and I look at the faucet, the utility water. And I think, what is wrong with me? <laughs> I just spent $700 on this cistern. It's full of water. I love water harvesting, <laughs> but I'm not using it. What is wrong with me? I then realized that I was using the city water because it was easier. I could turn on the faucet and walk to any part of the garden. But the way I had this set up in the past is if I wanted to use the rain tank uh, faucet, I had to step over garden beds. So I immediately turned off the water and dug up all my garden beds and changed the pathway so now all the paths radiate from the cistern faucet. So now it's easier to irrigate with the cistern water than it is with the city water. And now I don't use the city water. So the lesson here is you must design the system to be the easiest, most enjoyable system to use, or you won't use it. You, you don't use gravity. I do use gravity. From here. Gravity in, gravity out. And, okay. and uh, if your cistern is not close to your garden, you can plumb a 25 millimeter pipe, diameter pipe, from your tank to your garden, and then come up with a faucet. And put your garden faucet in the middle of the garden so it's easy to use. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, I didn't, I didn't have to. It, it already, in my case, it... Oh, so if your tank is far from your garden, you don't want the faucet to the tank to be at the, only located at the tank because it will be too far from the garden where you want to use the water. So bring the tank water to the garden with the faucet. It's better to have a 25 millimeter diameter pipe bringing the water to the garden 
than using a smaller diameter garden hose. Because if you have a small diameter garden hose coming this distance to the garden, the water will come out very slowly because of the surface friction of the smaller diameter hose. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So uh, we already saw this. How, yeah, you remember? In the sun talk, where I put my cisterns on the west side, the garden, so I get morning sun but afternoon shade. You guys all remember that? So, so my tank is a tank for water and a shade harvester and a sun harvester. And it's also a privacy screen because I put it on the western property boundary between me and my neighbor's property. Okay? And my neighbor's house right there, it's, well, my neighbor, he rents the house. He doesn't take care of it. The roof is full of holes. The wiring is really bad. So we are very likely going to have a fire come from our neighbor's house. So I'm really happy to have a concrete tank, which does not burn easily, full of water between the neighbor's house and my property. So it doubles as a fire break. Now, I do not want a plastic tank for that purpose because plastic is oil-based. So if it gets really hot or burns, it will become like lava. Okay? Um, come si può calcolare la, diciamo, la distanza o, o comunque se arriverà la pressione uh, per irrigare l'orto con la, la gravità? Cioè nel senso, per, per esempio, abbiamo un orto con uh, un tubo di 32 mm e poi le ale gocciolanti di 16 mm. Mm, quanta distanza riescono a coprire diciamo, i tubi per irrigare a goccia? Si riesce a calcolare? For example, oh, uh, a rule to calculate uh, anyway. You, you, you can calculate it, and uh, um, I can, uh, and I will give you one of those calculations at the end of this talk, okay? But with a gravity-fed system, if you are not concerned about keeping consistent pressure, if you just want some pressure, and it might take longer to irrigate, but water will still come through the system, you don't need to do the calculations, okay? But if you want more consistent flow, you need to. Uh, L'unico problema è che, diciamo anche riguardo alla lunghezza, nel senso che quando irrighiamo, chiaramente come abbiamo visto ieri, uh, i primi buchi hanno più pressione, gli ultimi buchi uh, hanno meno pressione, quindi bisogna arrivare anche agli ultimi buchi, diciamo con, con una pressione, sì, no, proprio agli, agli ultimi buchi del tubo per uh, avere anche le ultime piante irrigate. Okay, here's the basic rule of thumb. So you can have multiple irrigation lines or you know multiple valves, but each one 
<laughs> just like the laundry to landscape system, is not more than 33 meters long. Okay, so you remember in the gray water talk, we talked about the washing machine pump system, and we had a drip irrigation line coming from that, and we said you don't want that irrigation line to be longer than 33 meters. It's the same with a tank this size, a home system on a flat site. If you have your tank, you can have an irrigation line with your plants, okay? And you can have another one and another one. Three different lines. Each one has a cap on it and a cap. So you can, on Monday, connect this one. On Tuesday, you can connect this one. On Wednesday, this one. And each is 100, is 33 meters long maximum. Okay. And uh, with the T-tape, every, what's that? Every foot, every foot you have a hole, uh, an emitter, a hole. Okay. But uh, we have a, a system more complex. Okay. Uh, we have a, noi abbiamo mh, nel nostro orto, avendo dei bancali, the raised beds in our garden, uh, we have a pipe, uh, a, pri a, a principal pipe, a, really uh, two principal pipe, uh, diameter 32 millimeters, and um, smaller pipes for every uh, pipe. Raised bed, yeah. uh, diameter 16 millimeters. 16, okay. Yes. And uh, it's um, difficult to uh, have uh, the same pressure. Be yeah. Mm -hmm. si. Yeah. Yeah. Si. Si. Uh, si. 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 I singoli bancali, cioè il singolo bancale c'è un tubo che poi si sdoppia con una T e questa T ha cerchio, quindi hai la pressione che in teoria ti aiuta ad arrivare fino a fine. E ne metti un altro tubo dall'altra parte del principale, per faccio così, col bancale. Did you, did you solve it? No, no, no. Ok. Ok, so... Um, Uh, the nice thing about a drip irrigation system is the T-tape or other kinds of emitters uh, are somewhat self-regulating on the pressure. If it's just... An, okay. If it's just the open pipe, then it's much more difficult. So... Uh, For that calculation, I would have to research that calculation for you. Okay. Okay. Um, so in, in Australia, uh, they require every new home to be built with a rainwater tank this size or bigger. This is because during the drought, many communities ran out of water. So the way their system works is the rainwater comes into the tank, and as long as there is water in the tank, it will send water to three places, the outdoor faucets, for irrigation, the toilet, or the washing machine. It does not send water to the kitchen sink. So you don't need to uh, worry about filtering it to drink. 
And if, uh, so in the wet season, this acts like a flood control system because you're putting water into the tank, not the storm drain. And then you're flushing your toilet and washing clothes during the wet season. So you make more room in the tank for more rain. And then in the dry season, you, have, you can use rainwater until it runs out instead of city water. Okay. They have a valve here that is connected to a sensor in the tank. As long as there is water in the tank, it sends the tank water into the house. But if the tank goes empty, it sends utility water into the house. So you always have water as long as the utility has water. <laughs> then they put a water gauge like a Prius speedometer in the main room of the house. So people always know if the tank level is going up or down. And they found that homes with this system used 40% less water than homes without this system. Because they were more connected with where their water came from and their water use. Okay. They then did some computer modeling. And they found that if all the people, all the homes in Brisbane, Australia, if they were all to do this, they would not need to expand the public water infrastructure system for a hundred years. Because there'd be so much conservation. And this is how you can perhaps sell this to the water company. See, most water companies don't want you to conserve water. Because they make money selling water. But they were able to prove that the water company could save money and thus make money because they would not need to invest in expanding their pipes. Okay. Um, a simpler system than this valve is this. So when there's a float valve in your tank. And when the water gets down to, um, uh, to here, it kicks the valve on, and it will fill water up to here. And, but, and then it will stop. It will stop putting water. Then it drops back down. It puts more. Yeah. So, when you use the water in your tank, this float valve will tell your, your water faucet how much water is there. If, you, if it gets down to this point, the valve is turned on and utility water fills your tank to here. Like a toilet. OK. And then it stops. And then you use the water, it turns on again, it stops. OK. This, this is better if you fill the whole tank, you have no room to store for rainwater. OK? I'm doing this a little more. OK, so, so then uh, here, uh, and then if the, uh, uh, so there's always room for rainwater, but you also always have water in the tank from which you can send into the home. This is a way you can mix rainwater and utility water in the same tank, the same pipes. Okay? But, but let me say one last thing. The important thing for the water utility 
is there is this gap of air. So there is no way for rainwater to get into the city or public water system. That's what they want to see. Because if the rainwater was contaminated with bird poop and it got into the city system, there would be problems. Okay? Sorry, the last slide on the, on the bottom left of the picture, there's a thing I didn't understand. This, uh, and from those in history, John Kazakin and Kapisko, John Kontinitori, Soto, will. Uh, yeah. uh, That's the pump. It's the pump to pressurize the water. No. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so this, that's the overflow into the storm drain. The Australians have a lot of great things, and this is a horrible thing. Not, not okay, yeah, that's the bird nest, right. But no, what's horrible is their law does not allow you to send your overflow water to the landscape. It has to go to the storm drain, which is stupid. All right, here is how a cistern can cool you in summer, but not in winter. So there is a large water tank under the greenhouse. There are vent holes. So you get nice cool breezes coming off the water, and then they have vents up through the floor of the greenhouse to cool the greenhouse in summer. But in winter, they close all the vents. Okay. Now, water filtration. This is a, a woman I met who is very sensitive to chlorine, so she cannot drink the water from the utility. So she collects her rainwater in the tank, and she purifies it by putting it in glass jars in the direct sun. She does six hours in the full sun for two days. That's her number. Okay, she, is, she filters the water with solar distillation by using the sun, the UV rays of the sun, to purify the water. So for her, she puts the water in a glass jar, clear glass jar, and for 12 hours in the sun is good for her. Okay? She is not a scientist. She's done no study. That's just what she observed. But when they've done studies, if you put your water in the sun and raise it up to 65 degrees Celsius for just one second, you're good. It's, it's filtered. It's clean. It's distilled. Not distilled. It's pasteurized. No, she does this with her rainwater to just play it safe. So in Africa, they use thrown away plastic water bottles. And it works. It's faster than this because it's such a thin wall. But when the plastic starts to turn cloudy, it's very toxic. Okay. This is the system I use. Okay. I, I, um, so Potters for Peace is an organization that goes around the world and shows people how to make clay water filters with local clay and local ceramicists, local people. 
So you don't import anything, only knowledge. And the, they, it's low fired and very porous. They put a lot of straw in the clay. So when they fire it, there's a lot of pore spaces, air spaces. So you pour the water into the pot, which sits down here. And the water then goes through the clay and is collected in the bottom of the bucket. And you open it and get your water. This is painted with colloidal silver. So it uh, filters out over 98, oh no, I'm sorry, 99.98% of any organic contaminants. It's very effective and very inexpensive, okay? Um, you can even make the bucket out of clay. The bucket out of clay. But this will not protect you from human-made pollutants. It, it will not, this is great for viruses, bacteria, parasites. It's great for all of that. But it will not filter out pesticides, oil, uh, heavy metals. Okay, for that, you need an activated carbon filter. And this is an example of one. So in here is the activated carbon. So you pour the water in, filters out. But you need to change the carbon often enough Otherwise, the pollutants concentrate. And so. so the good thing about this is you only filter your drinking water, not your washing machine water, not your bathing water. OK? Is there a way to recycle, is there a way to recycle the filter of this kind of? Uh, okay, uh, so, ho chiesto se si possono riciclare i filtri perché il problema è che c'è tutto un commercio di filtri per cui io non, so, non lo sopporto questo, questo sistema I don't like this kind of uh, yeah. system because you have to pay always to pay to yeah. support this kind of system yeah, I, uh, great question I don't know if it's recyclable and I like you don't like the uh, disposable nature of it so, I tested the water coming out of my cisterns before I got a filter. And I recommend you do that. Most filters, they, com most companies that make filters say, buy this filter. But maybe you don't need it. First, see what is in the water. Maybe it's fine. So, I uh, tested my water a, an hour after the first rain after a long dry spell. So I tested the water at the time I most likely had the worst quality water. And there was no problem because I follow the water harvesting cistern principles. There's no light, there's no insects, there's no critters getting inside. You know, everything I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So I can just drink it straight. Um, wait, wait, but just, wait, 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 just a second. But just in case something happens that I don't know about, maybe somehow an animal gets in my tank because there's a hole in the screen. I don't want to risk uh, a friend's grandmother coming over 
and she's not well. Her immune system is not good. I don't want her to drink the water and get sick. So I have this just to play it safe. Okay? But for me, I don't need it. Okay. All right. uh, what, what kind of analysis do you, have you made? So, I, so what kind of analysis did I do? Is I uh, took it to the local lab and had them do their basic water tests where they're testing for the bacteria, the um, salmonella, the uh, uh, also um, pesticides, benzene, you know, all the, all the basic risks. Um, heavy metals. Heavy metals, yeah. And it was fine. So I, I knew I did not need a carbon filter because there were no human <coughs> pollutants that were an issue. The only potential risk was natural. Okay. Okay. This is another example of a more expensive kind. It's called a, it, this is a, uh, yeah, British Imperial, but now I forget the name. Berkey, it's Berkey. Okay, the brand. is Berkey. And they have both a carbon filter and a ceramic filter. But unfortunately, just like this, you throw away the carbon, you get new carbon. But I have an answer for that. Small answer. You can make your own. So, if you do a web search on aqueous solutions, Josh shows you how to make your own bucket, sand, and charcoal, charcoal filter. So you're basically making hardwood charcoal in your fire. Okay. Anyone right now? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it was that the one she did. I think it was that the one she did. I think it was that the one she did. I think it was that the one she did. I think it was that the one she did. I think it was that the one she did. I think it was that the one she did. Carbon. Yeah, you have to change your carbon or your charcoal occasionally. Yeah. You, you can do this a different way. You can collect all the water from here and go into there. Yeah. Con questo sistema è possibile filtrare le acque grigie, cioè quello di cui parlavamo ieri. Is it possible to filter gray water? Ah. Non è diventare potabile. You can. No, no. No, not to make it drinking water, but just to make it cleaner. 
You could, but it's going to gunk up fast. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know, it's a problem. Yeah. Okay, you can, if you write down the name of this book, you can download it for free. Many people in Hawaii live on rainwater. And most people uh, treat their water. This is, a, this is an above ground swimming pool that they put a sunscreen over. That's how most people have their tanks in Hawaii. And there's a plastic liner inside the metal. They, uh, um, they treat the water by adding bleach, chlorinated bleach. Uh -huh. And if you want to know how much, it's all in that book. Okay? But there is a risk of using bleach to treat your water. If your rainwater has a lot of organic matter in it, the chlorine will interact with that organic matter and create toxins. So you can only use bleach if you have good, clear, clean water with very little organic matter. What's that? You want the microphone? Microphone. 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 Is that for drinking water? Yes. And uh, is it not toxic? It, that is for drinking water, and it's healthy enough to drink if you do not apply too much of that. Okay. Um, most municipalities in the United States chlorinate the water. Yeah, so it's very common, um, but I'm just showing you another way you can do it. You can make the choice. So bleach doesn't have any, uh, uh, bleach doesn't eliminate organic uh, bacteria and that sort of thing? The bleach is going to kill off the parasites the, and deal with the p bacteria and all of that. That's why you're doing it. It's for the organic. Uh, huh? Yeah, bacteria. yeah, the living bacteria is what you're trying to kill. It's, it kills. So you're killing things but with did it. You not say it creates toxins if it's mixed with organic matter? Yes. But organic matter is different from living bacteria. Mm -hmm. When I say organic matter, I mean leaves, dust, okay. um, that kind of thing. Bird poop. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, another way you can treat your water, and this is how a lot of people do it in the United States, people who never test their water, they just want a filtration system, is they have a micron filter, a filter that filters out big particles, and then a carbon filter to filter out heavy metals, benzene, uh, viruses, and so on. And then you have a UV filter, which is an ultraviolet light that's for viruses, bacteria, all that. And you have to have the UV light after these two because if you have any particles in the water, <coughs> and let's say, let's say you are the UV light, and this hand is the dangerous bacteria, and this hand 
is a piece of leaf. Well, if this is in the shadow of this, the light won't kill it. So you have to get all that organic matter out first before the light. Okay? And you have to replace this light bulb about every year. Okay. And you have to replace this every year and this every year. Okay? Or drinking water. Okay. But again, maybe you don't need all that. First, test your water. Um, I'm going to skip, but, well, okay, I'll just say this. Um, a lot of people start harvesting rainwater by putting it in the toilet. Because <laughs> they don't, they think, ah, it's okay, we don't need to filter it. But the law in the U.S. says you have to put in a sign that says, rainwater, do not drink. <laughs> okay? Ah, I just hate that. Uh, um, so, uh, it makes me want to wet my face and hair in the sink and then go outside to where the people are that manage the building and just burp really loud and say, wow, that toilet water tastes great. Okay. All right. So, but what... But really what frustrates me about this is why go to the effort of harvesting rainwater, which can be a very high quality water if our air is not badly polluted. Why just put it into the toilet and then shit in it? What if we instead just don't shit in the water in the first place? That's this afternoon's talk. All right, I'm um, going to wrap it up here. Is, this is a brewery, a beer brewery in Atlanta, Georgia. And they make beer with rainwater. It's great for making beer because it's low mineral content. It's soft water. They get a lot of great press because it's a great story. Drink your rainwater. Um, the, this is the roof they collect it from, asphalt roof, okay? There's the tank, not a big tank because they get a lot of rain, so it fills regularly. Then they filter it, micron filter, carbon filter, UV. And uh, it is of a higher quality than the city utility water. Okay, and uh, you can drink it like a gentleman or a partying pig. Uh, but they do more than harvest rainwater at this brewery. They also harvest all their cooking, use cooking oil in a tank, which they use to fuel their. Um, Brewing operation, and to also. They also make. Uh, uh, biodiesel to run their catering trucks. And the, oh, say it again. So they also take the used cooking oil and they make that into fuel for their vehicles that deliver the food for the parties that they cater. How? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a very popular restaurant. 
It's a restaurant and brewery. Where is it? Atlanta, Georgia. And then they take the uh, used uh, uh, yeah, hops and wheat and all from the brewing and they make bread that they serve in the restaurant. And the, the uh, what they don't use, uh, they give to the local farmers to feed to their pigs, their goats, the chickens, or to make compost for the vegetables. And these same farmers provide the restaurant with their vegetables, their meat, all this. And they, it's all in the menu. They're, they're very open with this talking about the closed loops and how everything is reused and the connection with the grower and the restaurant. It's great. It's, it's like communicating the circle of life. Uh, okay. This is the landscape architecture building at the University of Arizona. There are three air conditioners on the roof. Yeah, so uh, they produce almost 400,000 liters of condensate a year that goes to the landscape. They also collect the rainwater from the roof. They also use the gray water from the drinking fountains in the landscape. So you have these wonderful living classrooms of life. Okay. And they have a big cistern in the middle of the building that collects the air conditioning condensate and the rainwater from the roof. They recirculate that water into a pond where they raise endangered fish and endangered frogs. So in the middle of the city, you've got this wonderful life. There's frogs everywhere. There's fish all over in the water. And there's great blue herons flying in and eating the fish. And uh, so it's amazing, this oasis of life in the middle of the city, a desert city, that is not using any virgin drinking water to irrigate this. And uh, when they take a wall away, they break up the wall and put it into the landscape, not the garbage. Just like this from yesterday, remember? Okay. The goal is to turn all of this into this. <coughs> and what will be the water for all of this? Well, this is a canyon. These are the mesa tops. So there's the water source, along with the air conditioner condensate, the gray water, okay, and the roof water to turn this transform this from a solar oven into a living classroom. And the last uh, slide uh, before lunch is uh, this is in Hawaii at the uh, Volcano National Park. And I had the opportunity to uh, go hiking there. And every 10 miles, 16 kilometers, I guess, there is a small shelter with a metal roof. And that collects rainwater in a tank. So that's your water. Every 16 kilometers, you have rainwater. And it's the best water. And then uh, here on the sea, there are 
sea turtles coming up <coughs> in the night. There's brackish pools here you can bathe in. The, when the sea is calm and there's no clouds, the stars go on forever into the water. The fishing is amazing. The wildlife here is incredible. And then you need to take a shit. And they have a compost toilet, <laughs> a true compost toilet. And all of it, um, it's great that there, all the waste is turned into a resource, improving the fertility, not polluting the water, not you know, damaging this beautiful area. And uh, I just felt like, ah, oh, this is great. I'm living off rainwater. I'm sending my wastes in a nice, safe way back into this beautiful environment so that now part of me is part of this. Okay. And I'm never constipated when I'm there because it's such a beautiful view out of the window while I sit there. Okay. Okay, of course I could see the view here, but whatever, that's the story. Uh, so I just mean to end by saying we have ways we can provide our water and deal with our waste that improve things, not make them worse. And after lunch, we will go over some basic calculations to figure out how much rain you have off a roof or another surface and also how you might want to size a tank. And for the people watching the live streaming <laughs> that uh, will miss that, you can go to uh, my website, harvestingrainwater.com, and on the, uh, oh, and then you can go to the water harvesting calculations page and I have all the calculations there. And in the next week, I will have them in Italian as well. Wow. Well, what Nico <laughs> translated. Okay. All right. Okay.